Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some, some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. This is Kyle Richards, the creator of the Total Sports Recall logo and owner of Abstract Sports, and you are listening to the Total Sports Recall podcast, a part of the Sports History Network. Now, here's your host, Harv Aronson. Welcome to the Total Sports Recall podcast. I am your host, Harv Aronson, and in this episode, I am doing a reversal. Football is Family podcast host, Jerry McFarland, had me on as a guest last weekend, and this weekend, he comes to Total Sports Recall to talk some more football. A little background on Jerry Mc. Jeremy McFarland. Growing up and living in the state of Tennessee, Jeremy did not have a pro team to root for. Therefore, it was during Super Bowl XXII when he, Jeremy started watching football and took a liking to John Elway. With that, he chose the Broncos as his team, and that fondness for Denver remained for many years after that. One of Jeremy's most memorable moments came in the NFL title game when Denver defeated Green Bay, and while a student at Freed Hardman University watching the Super Bowl, Jeremy yelled from his dorm room that the Broncos had finally won. The following season was just icing on the cake for Jeremy. His love for the Broncos ended with the trade of Jay Cutler, who is Jeremy's second favorite player ever. Growing up, Jeremy McFarlane was a Vanderbilt University Commodores fan. In 2008, he finally got to see the Vanderbilt Commodores play in a bowl game in what he calls the coldest game he ever attended, but the Commodores won the game. Years later, Jeremy was on hand to watch the Music City Bowl. Jeremy credits the great John Elway for his liking of the Tennessee Titans as he attended the first game the old Houston Oilers played in Tennessee when they faced the Washington Redskins. At that time, Jeremy was neither an Oilers or Titans fan, which not, which not until the infamous Music City Miracle play took place. Jeremy still recalls where he was when that play went down and subsequently freaking out due to the importance of that one play. After that, he was hooked. The ensuing Super Bowl, Jeremy watched from Freed Hartman, and in an effort to be part of the game's final play, Jeremy and his friends leaned like they were part of the play when Kevin Dyson tried to get into the end zone, and perhaps he and his friends could provide that extra push to get Dyson into the end zone. Jerry McFarland has attended several games, practices, attended the NFL draft held in Nashville, and has met several Titans players. Among his favorites are Eddie George and Frank Wycheck. Jeremy is also a game player, having played for the Titans several times while playing Madden, and has a collection of hats and jerseys too numerous for him to think about. Jeremy likes to say, football is not life, but it makes life better. I'm looking forward to many years of fandom and maybe meeting Derry, Henry, Derek Henry sooner rather than later. Jeremy, we have traded places this weekend. It was an honor and pleasure to be on your podcast last weekend. Now it's an honor and pleasure to have you on mine. Thank you, Harv, for, for having me on and for that introduction. Yeah, and... Jerry, first, uh, Jeremy, first and foremost, let's talk about Frank Wycheck. His story had a tragic ending on December 9th last month. While at his home in Chattanooga, he had a freak accident, falling and hit his head, and it resulted in his death. As I've experienced the loss of an idol way back in 1972 when Roberto Clemente was tragically killed in a plane crash, news of Wycheck's death must have been de- devastating to you. I got uh, two things about Frank, or actually three things about Frank. I- I, I had to show my, my daughter, my youngest daughter said, who's Frank Wycheck? And I, and I showed her this, uh, this bobblehead. I had to find this thing. I mean, you were talking about the bobbleheads that you got. I had to find this one. Um, he was the first, he was the first Titan I got to meet at a training facility. I mean, they had the Titans out there and I yelled his, he was about to leave and I yelled his name out and he signed a card for me. 
within about two or three months, I got his jersey. Uh, I can't tell you how many passes Steve McNair threw to Frank Wycheck. Uh, I'm I'm Madden, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, he I actually did a podcast about him several months ago about him being the pioneer for, you know, you had uh, Kellen Winslow as probably the uh, the original receiving tight end. You know, you had Mike Ditka back in the day. He was not a receiving mm-hmm. tight end so much as he was a blocker who can catch. Mm-hmm. Kellen Winslow blo- broke the mold, but for what I remember from the eighties and on, there there were a few receiving tight ends that could do it. But Frank mm-hmm. Wycheck in the in the nineties into two thousands became really the prototypical tight end that we think about today. That a lot of people owe it to him, but they don't see it. I mean, he wasn't a flashy guy. He had over five hundred receptions, which is insane. But mm-hmm. I remember him uh as not only a titan receiver he was originally a redskin but he was a titan receiver that made his made his uh name with the titans but he was a play-by-play guy for the titans with mike keith he was amazing he was a good good play-by-play guy and then later on he worked alongside uh several mark howard being one of them at the local 104.5 he was tragic and you think well how could a man who is in his 50s i don't i think it's 53 54 something like that fall and and die uh odds are if they do the testing he had cte he went down really really fast the way that he played the game was all out he was a blocker for eddie george eddie george would lorenzo neal was one of the guys that played for titans that helped eddie george during his time but Frank was the outside blocker that if Eddie broke to the outside, it was Frank Wycheck who blocked for him. You know, there are several other people that did it, obviously, but Frank is the guy. And I always remember watching him play and realizing that if he caught, if the ball was thrown in his direction, five, six, seven yards, whatever it was, Frank would catch it and turn it into 15. He was not a a burner, but he was a reliable receiver who would break tackles and cause people, uh, they wouldn't miss, but they would regret hitting him. And the way he played was, and, and he was a, a guy around this community that people respected and, and, and loved. And like I said, I only met him once. So I couldn't judge how good of a man he was from that simple meeting. But from what I heard and what I read and what I saw in, in, in the community, Frank Wycheck was a pretty good guy. I believe yeah. he went to the university of Maryland, I might be wrong on that. I wasn't thinking about that right now, but he was one of those guys that became who he was because Jeff Fisher realized just how good of a receiver he was. Yeah. Uh, You just never know. I mean, it's such a crazy freak accident and it's happened to Steelers too. I mean, uh, Steve Corson used to play for the Steelers offensive lineman was just uh, chopping down a tree in his backyard and the tree fell the wrong way and it was going towards his dog. He tried to move his dog out of the way and got hit by the tree and was crushed. So things can happen. That's awful. Um, but it, 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 yeah. And he too was around the same age as Frank Wycheck. So anytime somebody passes at that kind of age, um, you know, it's, it's a shame. Uh, and I'm sure he was a good man. Um, so tell me, tell our listeners, Jeremy, he- what the he music was, mi- miracle music city miracle meant pro to you. Bowler go ahead when the t- yeah. there. oh yeah well he's a three-time pro bowler what? and he's in the ring of honor I, i've seen his i've seen his ring of the ring of honor it's it was a pretty good guy um yeah he like was I a said, great player no doubt about it but like i said about the music city miracle at the time i was off a high from the broncos winning i i mean it was several years for me to watch Mm -hmm. John Elway try and fail. And he, he went to several Super Bowls, got beat. And when they won two, when he retired, I thought, Hmm, I don't know if they're ever going to return to prominence. They had Brian Greasy, Bubby Brister. They, they had several Mm -hmm. until, until, um, Peyton Manning came. So I started to kind of, you know, Titans had moved in. I've seen a couple, I saw a couple games. I watched them play the Redskins. I got to see, the first game in Nashville as the Oilers. And I still have the pin. It was about yay big, which you're on the podcast because you can't see that. Yeah, It's ugly, but I still have it. And 
you know, I, I knew the Oilers. I, I played against the Oilers on Tecmo Bowl, Super Bowl a lot. <laughs> Warren Moon was just an amazing guy, uh-huh. uh, quarterback. And then they had uh, – I, I contribute the loss in the playoffs to the Bills as the reason why we got the Oilers in the first place. Mm-hmm. I mean, after that, Bud Adams just burnt the whole thing down and we yeah. ended up getting the Titans. But – I was at a birthday party. I think the lady might have turned 100 years old that day. Wow. And in the back of the – it was Robbins Park and Dixon. In the back, they had some partitions, and I hear a bunch of guys just ah! – you know, like guys do when they're together. <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's that group mentality. We become cavemen is what it happens. Yeah. <laughs> and it's okay. Um, if I go to Buffalo Wild Wings and you give me chicken, I'll become a caveman. That's there all you. I say. And – and I, I walk back there, you know, I go and greet the lady because 100 years old, you have to have respect. It's just given. Mm-hmm. And I go back there and I notice the kickoff. And I'm like, okay, the Titans are going to lose. The Bills are going to go to the playoffs. The Bills are going to, could go further. And the kick was short. And I remember that Lorenzo Neal pitches it to watch. I mean, I'm quoting, mm-hmm. I'm quoting uh, Mike Keith. Because I remember him. And then Frank Wycheck throws a pass. Now, I've had a couple of Buffalo fans on my podcast. And they say, you know, that was a forward pass. I was like, Uh, that video has been checked more times than the Zapruder film back in John uh, John, uh, Kennedy's (laughs) assassination. It has been. And people said that is a that is a. Lateral pass, backwards lateral, reverse mm-hmm. lateral. It's a pass that went behind the line of scrimmage where he mm-hmm. was. Kevin Dyson receives the pass and runs it in. And I have right here. Oh, here it is. Right here. Harv, I, I got this for Christmas one year. Uh-huh. It was a Christmas present to me. Oh, it's wow. It's Music City Miracle. Wow. Yeah. Uh, That's really cool. I was not there. Uh-huh. Because, again, I was not a Titans fan at the time, and tickets were not available. But I remember jumping up and down, like, why am I excited about this? This, isn't not, my, this is not my team. <laughs> but it was, it was the moment. Yeah. It was the moment. And, 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 and I'm convinced if, if they won that Super Bowl this year, they would have won it next the, the year after that. They were that good. Yeah, they were a good team. And, and you don't have to be a Titans fan – or a fan of any team to enjoy a great play. I mean, I watched that play happen as well. And I, it was exciting for me as it was for a Titans fan. It was so cool. I mean, you love to see that kind of stuff. And, and it well, kind of, it, yeah, it's, go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. I was just going to say, um, you're talking about it, how they replay it and they watch it, try to determine if it's a forward pass or not. Well, the same thing happens with the Immaculate Reception. That clip has been played a billion times and people are still trying to determine whether or not that ball hit French Fuqua or Jack Tatum. And French Fuqua, he's funny because he'll do speeches and he'll say, lead up to it, you know, like he's going to tell you who, what happened. And then he says, well, I don't think I'm going to say it right now. And he's been doing that ever since. <laughs> it's hilarious. I remember, I remember watching a video where somebody calls him at that moment. It was, quote, Roger Goodell. And he said, okay, I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah. So, um, but that play, that play really, because we finally had a team in the Middle Tennessee area. Tennessee, Harv, I don't know if you're familiar with this state. It is mm-hmm. one of the longer states in the Union. It's not wide, but from Bristol to Memphis is six or seven hours, depending on how wow. fast you drive and how. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a long state. Not you know, Pennsylvania is obviously long, but mm-hmm. Tennessee is weirdly shaped. This state, up until the the Tennessee River, which is just about three miles from where I live, is an orange state. It's it's University of Tennessee that's yeah. just cemented here. Mm-hmm. Past that way, you find a smattering of a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, pro football has not taken off in Tennessee. You know, it it, it probably fifteen years. Mm-hmm. Mike Keith once said that the adults in the room will not be the fans for the Titans. It will be the kids. Hmm. So now you find a lot of the kids growing up in this area finally have gotten the two-tone blue. Mm-hmm. It's still a college state, but there's a lot of Titans fans mm-hmm. here, especially since we got the king, Derrick Henry, here. 
that really changed a lot of things. But the Music City Miracle got me focused on the Titans, and it's been a sickness ever since then. Uh, I don't call it a sickness because then if you're sick, I'm sick. Yeah, it's the a Steelers. sickness, Harm. <laughs> yeah, I've actually been accused of that by my wife. So, hey, listen, uh, the Steeler fans are all going to be Tennessee Titan fans tomorrow because they're really hoping that they can uh, upset the Jaguars. And down here in Jacksonville, um, they almost are all on the radio convinced that Jacksonville wins this game easy. I, I disagree. I think Titans are going to pull the upset tomorrow. What do you think? Okay, well, tomorrow's game is not what last year's game was, which made me sick. We lost, what, seven in a row? Mm -hmm. We were – or no, I don't remember exactly the, the number, but we had the AFC South wrapped up until Ryan Tannehill got hurt, and then we – we had Malik Willis, which I like Malik. Yeah. I like Malik. Um, and then we had to get Josh Dobbs because Malik couldn't throw a pass over 10 yards. Mm -hmm. And we almost pulled that off. But we would have been bounced in the first round of playoffs regardless. But anyway, tomorrow's game is bittersweet. I want to be there, but my job, I can't be there. Mm -hmm. And I probably can get really good tickets right now by saying, hey, does anybody want to give me a ticket? Yeah. And they just said, sure, let's give you a ticket. Yeah. If we win – Jacksonville still probably will make the playoffs uh, because I think Houston and Indianapolis are playing. The winner of that, mm -hmm. if Jacksonville loses, the winner of that will make will be the AFC South. Mm -hmm. But I, but if I remember correctly, some of the odds I was hearing that Jacksonville still could make it. But if we lose, our draft board will be better. Yeah. So I don't know what I want. Uh, I believe that Ryan Tannehill is is playing. Mm -hmm. Don't start Will Levis. Put keep him on the shelf. <laughs> he's he's our future. We're not yeah. signing Tannehill next year. Sure, uh, we're not. Uh, and then the Malik is the backup. But if the Titans win, sure, we still might not knock Jacksonville out of the playoffs. But if we lose, we still seventh seed, sixth seed in the in the uh, draft board. So it's pretty good. Yeah. So Pittsburgh's playing at four thirty today with. Uh, with Baltimore and Baltimore, of course, they've wrapped up the number one seat. So they're resting almost all their starters, uh, a bunch of them. And we're, we're riding a hot streak right now. So pretty sure I'm pretty confident that we're going to win. All the Steelers fans are confident win, but for us to get in either the easiest path is for the Jaguars to lose or Buffalo to lose to Miami and Miami. So I think our chances look pretty good, but I, I would like to see, Jacksonville lose because they're so confident down here that they're going to win that game and it's <laughs> going to be no contest. And um, your head coach, uh, he he said, I don't like to lose. He says, well, you people are crazy. But one thing that kind of irked me the wrong way, Jeremy, is I was listening to this uh, Locked on Stewards podcast yesterday. Every Thursday they have um, somebody from another team coming on. Well, he played clip yesterday from the, the Locked on Titans uh, host of that show and he was actually publicly said he was kind of hoping the team would tank so he'd get a better draft position uh, I mean I, I personally I don't like to hear that from anybody that's supportive of a, of a team you never want to tank a game I mean that's ridiculous I don't know how you can uh, Mike Vrabel is a very aggressive. He's not a Dan Campbell aggressive. Dan, if you fail twice to get a two point conversion, kick the field goal. That's all I can say about that. Kick the field goal. Mike Vrabel <laughs> is an aggressive coach, and you can tell that last year really graded at him, and this year is also the same thing. But I blame John Robinson for a lot of that. Uh, don't trade AJ Brown. Figure out a way to mm -hmm. sign him to a twenty million dollar a year contract. Sure. But again, I'm not the GM. Um, don't tank. You know, I remember the the Colts tanking for luck, mm -hmm. and they nearly missed him. Yeah, they nearly missed him. The Redskins would have got him. But uh, how is it that you think that your fan base would appreciate that? Mm -hmm. People vote with their money. Yeah, if you want to sell stuff, you you've got to keep winning. Mm -hmm. The Titans were on the board for or, or high on the hog for about three or four years, mm -hmm. and then we bottomed out last year because of injuries and this year because of uh people we have on our team but, it just yeah and if you purposely tank and, and it becomes obvious that's an embarrassment i mean you don't want to lose like that so let's hope that 
Tennessee plays hard tomorrow and really tries to win the game. I really think they have a shot um, because Jacksonville, their starting quarterback's a little banged up. He may not even play. So they have a shot. I think they have a legitimate shot to win that game. I had a story when I was at Freed. I was interviewing at in in Saint Augustine. So the church that I was interviewing at Har flew me down to Jacksonville, and the preacher came and picked me up. And I didn't realize it that I was wearing a Titans hat. And uh, I've got I I got a lot of bad looks that day as I was walking <laughs> around in Jacksonville. Yeah, luckily. It's not recent in the last couple of years, or it might have been worse. Yeah. Yeah, Jacksonville does not like the Titans, and I think the feeling is mutual. Well, trust me, they don't like Pittsburgh fans at all, because there are (laughs) thousands and thousands, and I kid you not, thousands of ex-Pittsburghers like myself living down here. Uh, and I used to go to several games here and it was never, never pretty sight. Uh, we actually took over downtown Pittsburgh, uh, downtown Jacksonville, uh, uh, Friday night before one game. Uh, they really didn't like that. And then we started calling this place Jacksonburg. Uh, that kind of irked them as well. Uh, so <laughs> I know the feeling, uh, it's interesting when you were talking about being a Denver fan, John Elway fan, all that, uh, you mentioned Bubby Brister. Well, there you have an ex Steeler. Brister played for the Steelers as well, but it made me think that we had another Denver uh, cast off, uh, Tommy Maddox, who actually came and played very well for us. Uh, And it was because of Tommy Maddox that Ben Roethlisberger became a starter because Maddox got hurt. uh, Roethlisberger stepped in as a rookie and never gave up his job. He was the starter from that point forward. I remember that, that they drafted, the Broncos drafted Tommy Maddox and US UCLA. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, it's it's eight o'clock, eight thirty in the morning. My daughter woke me up really early, so I'm kind of running on about two cylinders right now. <laughs> he got drafted to replace Elway, mm-hmm. and Elway was very very upset about that and mm-hmm. went to went and did what he did. And Tommy, I believe, retired or or dropped to just quit playing and then played in the uh, played in, in in another league and came back and did yeah. well with Pittsburgh for yeah, several years he did. and then then didn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was. I remember after Elway died, there was a, a Sports Illustrated article about Bubby Brister that his wife compared him to a puppy <laughs> because he goes hard for for a few hours and then takes a nap every day. Oh no! And why in the world do I remember that? And I can't even remember my daughter's birthday. Sometimes it's just funny how that works. Yeah, he was in an Arena Football League. I think he actually yes, won the he won the title for that league. Uh, and then he was a salesman when the Steelers gave him a call. Uh, so we called him Tommy Gunn, um, and he was good. He was a good passer. He was, he was, and he wasn't given the opportunity to play in Denver. And, and here's the thing that really kind of got me about Denver when they, I wanted the Titans to draft Jay Cutler. <clears throat> they had the perfect opportunity to draft Cutler. He was a local boy. Mm-hmm. He was a guy who would have done well. He's not the best person in the sense of personable. He's just not. But I don't care so much about the person when you're playing in football. I mean, if you're in the trenches, everybody is the same person. Yeah. You know? uh, when they didn't do that, I thought, well, okay, the Broncos, that's my second team. That's good. And then Josh McDaniel came about, didn't like how Cutler reacted to him, so he hmm. traded him off. And I thought, all right, Denver. Yeah. All right, Denver. That's about all I can handle. Uh, and now I see Jay Cutler on the um... – one of these sports talk shows on television. I forget which one it is, but I've seen him on there. He's now the co-host of one of these shows. He's that, yeah, and he's he's pretty pretty good co-host. He is, yeah, he's good. Uh, pe- people just didn't like him because he just he didn't have the personality mm-hmm. or he didn't care. And and I remember they were in the uh, NFC Championship game against Green Bay. I was wearing I had a Denver Bronco jersey, and I have now have a a Chicago Bears jersey. I was wearing the Bears jersey, and he gets hurt. Uh, he'd be back in. Well, his his knee was a sprain in that. Mm-hmm. People are like, oh, he's weak, he's weak. I've never had a sprain in my knee. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that would be like, but he obviously didn't play in Green Bay, came back and won. Yeah. And that was 
closest thing he got to a Super Bowl. I mean, I've I've banged my knee up a couple of times in the minor, and it hurts like hell. So I can't imagine these guys to tear up their knees. How painful that must be. I mean, it's got to be bad. Um, I started I started at the gym for a couple of days last week and or this week, and upper body was okay, hard, but the lower body I regretted my life. I regretted my life after that. Point, oh no, so I can't imagine being hit. Yeah, and you talk about the the whole backup. I mean, the whole drafting of quarterbacks and uh, irking starting quarterbacks. Uh, they say that about Ben Roethlisberger when they drafted Kenny Pickett. Um, that you know, hey, wh- why are you drafting this guy? And and now Pittsburgh is just swarming with quarterback controversy because Mason Rudolph's riding a hot hand right now, and Kenny Pickett is is riding the bench, and now all the the buzz in Pittsburgh is. Uh, is Kenny Pickett ever going to get his job back? What's going to happen to Mason Rudolph? So it's pretty interesting. Uh, we'll see how Mason uh, plays today. But I actually think what? Mike Tomlin made a major mistake and should have made Mason Rudolph the starting quarterback the moment Ben retired and given him a chance. He never gave him the right opportunity. And now look what he's he doing. Didn't. But I'm glad his head was finally inflated after what Miles Garrett did to him. Yeah, That's awful. <laughs> you don't use a helmet, Miles, but boy – I'm surprised Mason Rudolph didn't get seriously hurt for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. Well, as you mentioned, you became a John Elway fan after Super Bowl twenty two, and Elway is considered by some as one of the best quarterbacks in history. So given that, who do you think is the best quarterback ever and why? All right, that's a very divisive question, obviously. Elway's numbers are incredible, but if you look at his interception to touchdown ratio, it's a little bit deceiving. Um, different eras, like, you know, you had autogram just uh-huh. dominate championship, but his numbers were not good. Cause he had Jim Brown. He, mm-hmm. he really didn't have to do much. And that, that era of passing was different than say, mm-hmm. uh, that was in the forties and fifties. That era would have been different than when the passing game started with in, in the seventies and eighties with the West coast was more emphasizing the short pass, mm-hmm. but you go into the fifties and the sixties, Johnny Unitas was probably the best quarterback at that point and was still ranking the top five. Mm-hmm. In the 70s, Terry Bradshaw was not the prototypical quarterback. He no. was a good quarterback. We talked about this yep. last week. Mm-hmm. Terry Bradshaw would have been the one that if you said, I have a game on the line, who do I want? And well, sure. Terry Bradshaw. But at the same time, you had Dan Fouts with, the, with Don Coriel. You had him 70s into the 80s that – he was the guy that would have been considered the best quarterback, but he didn't win championships. So in the 80s, it was Joe Montana and John Elway neck and neck, but Joe Montana won the championships. Mm-hmm. The 90s, um, Jim Kelly would have been considered probably the best passer, but Troy Eggman won the championships. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve Young in that time was great. In the 2000s up until recent, it was Tom Brady and there's no debate. You know, I don't care if you like him or don't. He's got, well, seven rings. Yep. Uh, so what do you, how do you define the quarterback? Uh, I would put top three or top four, the the Mount Everest, or excuse me, Mount Rushmore mm-hmm. of quarterbacks, John Unitas, mm-hmm. Joe Montana, Tom Brady, and that fourth one would be debatable. It, it, John Elway would not be there, mm-hmm. although I remember the drive. I remember the fumble. I remember the Super Bowls. I get that. That's personal. Uh, probably Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning would be there. Yeah, I'm, th- I'm glad you mentioned Peyton because he is my number one. I-, I just think that guy was the most efficient, smartest quarterback ever. He was like a machine. Uh, so fun to watch because he was just so automatic. Um, and obviously Brady's numbers speak for himself, but I'm glad you mentioned Otter Graham because I wrote an article once on greatest quarterbacks ever. And I don't think Otter Graham gets the credit he deserves. This dude won a a league title, I think in every single year, but one of his entire career, he only played 10 years, but I think every year he won a title. And it's crazy. Nobody can say that. It was eight or nine when it it was eight or nine titles uh, Mm -hmm. on a team on a team that was, I believe, the All-American Football League and mm-hmm. then moved over to the NFL and, mm-hmm. and people thought, well, they can't win. And mm-hmm. then <laughs> Paul Brown said, uh, just hold hold my beer. And they won that year. Was it the Rams that they played? 
just dominated them, mm-hmm. and I think the next year as well. Otto Graham was not a good actor. If you ever watch his commercial for <laughs> cornflakes or something, he was not a good actor. I have to Google but, that one. Oh please, autogram uh, commercials. <laughs> he was awful. Oh my gosh! Uh, because he was a football player. Yeah, he was not an actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, later on, Jim Brown would be a good actor. Yeah, uh, in the movies he did, mm-hmm. and of course Brett Favre being the greatest actor in something about Mary. <laughs> just his can. If you want to go with pure passer, just mm-hmm. a leader that wouldn't make a lot of dumb decisions. And Brett Favre did, although he was a great player. Don't get me wrong. He was one mm-hmm. of the best. I would go with those four. And mm-hmm. you say, well, my, my game is on the line. Who do you want to drive 98 yards? Guess where that comes from yeah. in less than two minutes. Uh, give me John Elway any day. Give me yeah. John Elway any day. And Joe Montana is right that. up there too with that. Oh, oh, that Super Bowl against the Bengals. Mm-hmm. I remember that when yeah. Bengals were up, was it 16-13? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and it, again, this is because my daughter woke me up this early. I believe John Taylor caught that pass in I the end zone. Right. It was a slant that, that Joe Montana mm-hmm. threw a bullet, a laser, mm-hmm. and Taylor caught it and won the game. And, and I believe Steve, uh, Steve Walsh, uh, why she looked up and, and saw Montana come out and said, "Uh oh," <laughs> he said, "Uh oh." Lizzie knew what what Joe Montana could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, Joe Montana was Joe Cool, yeah, and he still is. He's still one of the coolest dudes you ever see. Oh yeah, and, and you can't forget about my homeboy either, uh, Dan Marino. Uh, he was one hell of a passer. Unfortunately, he never got to win a Super Bowl, but I would put him up in the top ten for sure. I mean, he was- oh oh no doubt and. And here, here's the thing. I, I don't like people saying that Super Bowls make the better quarterbacks. If I remember this correctly, Harv, mm-hmm. there's 21 other people that on that starting team. And a quarterback right. can make a team mm-hmm. and break a team. But he mm-hmm. – Elway led three uh, – He is Super Bowl against the Redskins and then the, the Giants and then the 49ers. Uh, Giants, then the Redskins, and then the 49ers in, in that order – he willed that team to the Super Bowls each time that they were in it, but he, it, but it took a whole. The the Forty ers just destroyed, and so did the Redskins. Just destroyed the Broncos because they were not a complete team. Elway could not do it by himself. Yeah, and I mean, think about it. Uh, when Baltimore won the Super Bowl with Trent Dilfer, <laughs> Dilfer is nowhere in the top fifty quarterbacks, but he was the winning quarterback for the Super Bowl, and it was mostly. Because- I got. I got to meet him really? all, at of all places at the Vanderbilt Hospital, Children's Hospital in Nashville. I was visiting a friend's daughter that was in the hospital, and I walked down there, and I had the visitor pass on. And he said, do you have a kid here? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I got to meet him. He, he's not the biggest guy that you ever think about, uh-huh. but the fact that he was visiting kids in the hospital, showing them the Super Bowl ring was mm-hmm. awesome, and, and I do appreciate that, trend. Yeah, there's a bunch of quarterbacks you could name that weren't great quarterbacks, but their teams got them there. Jim McMahon from Chicago Bears in 86 when they won it. That team was all defense, and it's a defense that really got them the Super Bowl victory, but Jim McMahon's a starting quarterback, and he's nowhere near a top 20, 30 quarterback either. He is not, but again, you have to have a guy like him uh, to to lead a team as crazy as the the Bears. Mm. Um, you know, I look at their again. We can go off on some tangents here. Their defense was probably I, I would take their defense and put it today. Four six defense mm-hmm. um, would have been exploited now, but with uh, Buddy Ryan, if he was willing to relent a little bit, he could probably adapt pretty fast especially with that team yeah it was amazing defense and for anybody out there that hasn't seen the super bowl shuffle please google that because that is hilarious. oh gosh i can watch it a million times over it's the funniest thing ever <laughs> i was thinking i was thinking hard when i was growing up they had it we had a in, in dixon we had a, a public library down the road and my mom was a mm-hmm. school, school teacher so during the summer she had off so we went there one time and they had a they had a VHS, and if kids don't know what a VHS is, there's yeah. you three things to Google today. Yeah, you're lucky to live in the world that we're living in right now. Exactly. And there was a a VHS of the Los Angeles Lakers with Magic Johnson, AC Green. And, wow. Uh, I think 
Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was in this, and they were singing about being drug free. Oh no! They had they made a music video about being drug free. Wow! And this is coming from the Lakers. Yeah. If you ever watch that Showtime show on uh, uh, HBO or whatever that is, they were not drug free. That's hilarious. Well, it was awful. I'm showing my age, but yeah, I remember VHS tapes because I used to record Steeler games on VHS tapes. But uh, to show my age even a little more, I, I was back in the day with eight track tapes and cassette tapes oh, when they were popular. Golly, eight track. My granny, my granny had a car. It was a tank. Uh-huh. It was a boat. And I remember riding in it, and she had an eight track tape. Yeah. And she said, "Well, if you want to hear the other side, just flip it over." <laughs> Yeah, I had one of those yeah. in my car. I had an eight track uh, player, eight track tape player in my car as well. So that was a long, long time ago. Uh, oh, that's great. They need to make a comeback. Yeah, absolutely. Seventies <laughs> were the best. I'm telling you. Um, so let's take a step backwards a little bit to the Titans. Yeah. Uh, another tragedy we're going to talk about here is a Titans fan. What's your feeling and opinion of Steve McNair's career and how his life ended? Uh, I remember that was July 4th. Uh, I was, I woke up July 4th thinking I'm going to, my son and I, we're going to blow stuff up. That's, I, I raised him to be a, an explosive expert. And he was, he was till the, till he passed. Um, and I get a notification. Somebody sent me a message, say, check the TV out. And to find out what happened to Steve McNair, I, I, Steve McNair was a big name in the community. I almost had a chance to meet him. If I was more of a Titans fan at the time, I would have met met him. I met Eldar Greco, which was cool. But anyway, Mm. it was at the Bellevue uh, Mall at the time. They were there trying to get people to drum up. So he was big in the community. He was a very quiet guy. He was a Mississippi kid who who did well at Alcorn State State, and was not considered an a – was not considered a high draft pick, but went pretty high with the Oilers at the time and did great. Him and Eddie George teamed up. It was awesome. And that year that he was in, uh, that he was going to be drafted, I had a, and I wish I still had it, a Sports Illustrated that had him on the cover, said give him the Heisman. He should have won the Heisman that year. He would have if he was in a bigger market. Alcorn State is not a big market. It's a small school. When I found out why he died, and I have a book around here somewhere that's like it's talking about the conspiracy theories behind his death. If you don't know, I'm not going to badmouth the person here. He didn't leave the he didn't live the most wholesome life outside football. And how he died was awful. We heard he died. We didn't know the deal. So I wore my Steve McNair jersey to the fireworks show that I was in. As of playing, during this time, the Oilers were very short yardage running, especially with Eddie George. Eddie George got drafted, then Steve McNair. And they were run-oriented. They were defense that was pretty good, but their offense was what's going to hold it. McNair really kind of changed Jeff Fisher. Later on, Jeff Fisher became the coach. Jeff Fisher's view of passing and about year 2000 or so that he let Steve McNair do what McNair does. And he won the MVP later on, co-MVP with Peyton. He was a, if he had played more passing uh, earlier on, he would have been considered one of the higher ranking quarterbacks of all time. Now he's a good one. If they had focused on the passing and Jeff Fisher was not a passing court, uh, coach. He was not. Uh, they would have been more, uh, he would have been higher up. He was a very gritty player. Uh, Jeff Fisher said that they would lose him before games. They couldn't find him, and he would have found a place over in the corner to snap. Hmm. And he said, oh, we're going to be fine. He's napping. Uh, there were times where he would go up in planes, and due to the a- altitude, he would hurt so much that he couldn't sit down. Wow. And that altitude would play on his back problems. He had hmm. awful back problems. Uh, shoulder problems. We would joke that he was always hurt. Well, he was because of how he played. Yeah, He was a big guy who was used to running. He was a mobile quarterback that was not, he was much bigger than Fran Tarkenton, much bigger, much better arm. 
but he took so many unnecessary hits mm-hmm. because of some of the offensive line problems we had later on. We had Frank Miller. We had uh, uh, we had several guys on the offensive line that were good, but the way that McNair would roll out, that they couldn't just block for him forever. He would take some unnecessary hit, mm-hmm. and would uh, he would stay on the uh, the injured list for for a long time with the same problems. Uh, he gave the Titans hope for several years, and my problem with how his career ended with the Titans is that I don't know if he was owed a lot of money and he they would have to pay him even if he was hurt. So they locked him out of the facilities. Oh. And I remember looking at Harv, I remember this, that they had a picture of him in the Tennessean leaving the facilities because he couldn't get in. I didn't know that. Now, this is the same type of thing that happened to Aaron Hernandez after mm-hmm. he was thought to have murdered. Sure. That's the same concept, except... McNair didn't do that, obviously, mm-hmm. but it's mm-hmm. the same concept. And then he went to the Ravens, which I still haven't forgiven the Ravens for the 2000 knocking out my Titans in the playoffs. Still haven't <laughs> forgiven them. So to think, and I have right over here uh, a McFarlane, uh, Steve McNair. Well, let's see if I can pull it up here. Let's see if I can get it for you. Okay. Um, There it is. Oh, wow. You see that yep. way that he's throwing the ball? Yeah. That's how McNair. He's leaning off on his foot, throwing the ball, and that's how he did it. They actually remade that McFarlane figure in Baltimore Ravens purple. Oh, and no. I, no, I couldn't do it. <laughs> and I know you being a Steelers fan understand what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. When the Titans beat the Ravens in the playoffs a couple, three years ago, it was one of the happiest moments of my football life. <laughs> I just felt sort of vindicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we won the Super Bowl that year, I would have written. Hey, uh, my wife and my son uh, went to Washington a few years ago, and they went to Baltimore, I think, to see Fort McHenry, which would have been I always want to see that. And mm-hmm. they said, "Well, we're not going to send pictures to you." I was like, "Thank you." <laughs> and they drove by Baltimore, the the stadium, and I asked my son, "Did you did you urinate on it?" Oh no. I'm trying to be yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to be wholesome because but I can't be that way. And it's a family show, so did you did you mark your territory? And he said, Dad, I'm not gonna do that. I'm like, Yeah, you're gonna do that. Yeah, that's funny. Of course, now I'm just messing, but uh McNair was it the the playoff run where they went to the Super Bowl was was all Titans in the sense of running the game. But if you notice the last couple of plays McNair, the last play, McNair stopped to throw the ball to Dyson, and his leg locks. Mm. And I'm surprised that his knee didn't buckle inward, how hard he stopped. Mm -hmm. But because McNair came from a bad background and was making good, he was not going to let that play stop. It might not have been the last play. It might have been the play before that. But the pass for Dyson that was stopped by Mike Jones one yard short it, McNair tried to hold on to that ball another second, but the offensive line broke, and he had to get rid of the ball. But McNair knew that if he held on the ball for another second, the way Dyson was cutting and the way his passes were, it would have been a touchdown. Just watch that last play, mm-hmm. and you'll see what I'm talking about. If he held on to one more second, it would have been a perfect pass and would have been a touchdown. Wow. Well, I know what you're talking about with players leaving your team because, you know, we cringe when Rod Woodson left for Baltimore as well. Um, and that was over a contract dispute. And I believe it was only about a million dollar difference from what Baltimore was offering and what was Pittsburgh was offering. And he took the higher deal and Stewart fans did not like him for that for a while, but you know, he's now coveted as an all time Steeler. He went into the hall of fame as a Steeler, but yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> Actually last weekend, Devin Bush, who used to play for the Steelers, we let him go, is now playing in Seattle. And uh, Kendrick Jones, our rookie offensive lineman, there's a still photograph of him getting in his face. And um, somebody said, keep your keep your ass here in Seattle or something like that. They were giving him a hard time, so it's kind of funny. Uh, and you're talking about Jeff Fisher. It made me think of something. I was writing little notes as I'm listening. But for those who don't know, Jeff Fisher used to be a player. Bill Cowher was a linebacker when he played football and it was on special teams. And he's well known for having tackled Jeff Fisher on as he was returning a ball 
hitting him so hard he broke Jeff Fisher's leg. So for those who oh. aren't, aren't aware of that, that did take place way back in the day. And again, I think Jeff Fisher, again, this is just one of those things I'm remembering things. I want to make certain Jeff Fisher was on the 85, 86 Bears. Yeah, he was he was one of the players on that. Now, I don't think he was a, a big name, but mm-hmm. he was on the Bears. So you notice his his specialty was defense, and the Titans really started to blossom because – well, if you look at the 90s, the 80s and 90s Oilers before Fisher became the coach, they were more of a passing team because they had one of the better passers of all time. War Moon's top 15, easy, easy. Mm-hmm. And with with their run and shoot offense, they were not emphasizing the run, but it was more of a short pass to a long pass type offense, which allowed them to move the ball and run up the score against the Bills the way they did in that playoffs, but they couldn't control the ball. So you would have a lot of three and outs or or four or five play drives that would end in a punt, which allowed Frank Wright to do what he did. Uh, A same guy from Maryland who, who, uh, had one of the greatest comebacks in, in college football history, did it for the Bills a few years later. I remember Jim Kelly getting knocked out in the game previous, and the Bills thought, oh, the game, the season's over. Well, Frank Wycheck said, again, hold my beer, and <laughs> look what he did. Jeff yeah. Fisher was the, the guy that was 8-8, eight 8-8, and 8-8, eight, eight and, eight, eight and, mm-hmm. eight, and then all of a sudden, boom. And he became the all-time winning coach in Oiler Titan history a few years later. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. He deserves yeah. recognition. And my friend mm-hmm. said, do you know how long he coached here? <laughs> he, <laughs> he coached for a long time, and that's mm-hmm. why he did it. I was like, oh, just why don't you just pop the guy's bubble? Yeah, oh, geez. And, well, you just mentioned the Super Bowl. So if the Titans did have one more play in Super Bowl 34, you think they win that game? Well, you remember the play, the the – Marshawn, uh, the Marshawn Lynch, the, the should have been run with the Seattle Seahawks and it's the New, Orleans, New England Patriots. Funny you say that. Remember that? I wrote it in my notes. That was what I was going to mention in uh, in conjunction with this question because everybody that, who's anybody that watched that game agreed that it should have been a Marshawn Lynch run. Hundred uh, percent. Seattle blew that game. They would have won. He would have got. Uh, he would have scored. 100%. He would have scored. And. What would have happened is if they had another timeout, they would have called it. They were one yard short, and they would have lined up with Eddie George in the back in the backfield. I am convinced that if the if the St. Louis Rams at the time were smart, they would have put eight in the box. You do not let Eddie George or Derrick Henry at the time, or even Chris Johnson a few years after and before Henry, but after. Uh, Eddie George, you do not let Eddie George run wild. He will hit that that one yard. So they would have they've been a play action fake, and and McNair, who is very mobile, would have would have curled in over the left and would have mm-hmm. scored a touchdown. It would have been you would have faked it to Eddie, and then you would have gone in on your own, mm-hmm. and, and people would have bit. They would have bit hard because again, Eddie George was you know he's a ten thousand yard back. He was very much the focal point of that offense and he still i got to meet him a few years ago he signed my madden football game that he was Mm -hmm. on he signed my jersey i'm pointing to him like you could see him yeah that dude was huge and he's still a big guy now compared to derrick henry everybody's small (laughs) but eddie was eddie and even if eddie would have gone up against eight man box he still probably would have made it so if they had one more play i think they would have tied the game Mm -hmm. So looking ahead to next season, 2024, you already mentioned, uh, you know, resting Will Levis tomorrow. So he's your quarterback of the future. You say Ray Tannehill is going to be gone. So is it going to be Levis next year? And do the Titans find another quarterback to compliment him or stick, stick with Malik? Uh, see, Malik will f- probably find a better team. He would be more suited for uh, Atlanta Falcons or some team like that. And when we got him last year, I was very excited because I saw I've seen some of his games. I watched some of his games, I should say, at Liberty. Mm-hmm. And the guy can play. He is a good player. He's just not <laughs> suited for the offense that the Tennessee Titans have. It, there's just not. Um, 
he's more suited for can he be can he go off out of the pocket and throw in and Tannehill can do that he's an improviser but he's uh, Malik is not as big physically as Tannehill is Tannehill starts tomorrow uh, and we give him a standing ovation because yeah he did throw that throw uh, three interceptions I believe against the Bengals and we should have won that game I remember watching that game and having tears in my eyes because I thought we had the number one seed and we blew it Mm -hmm. last year. Tannehill goes down. If he doesn't go down, we would have won the South running away this year. If Tannehill was healthy, we might've won seven games. (laughs) I mean, maybe. Well, Um, uh, I'll be a big uh, Ray Tannehill fan tomorrow. A huge one. (laughs) I'm hoping. Here's the problem. Next year we have 75 million or more in cap space. Mm Mm-hmm. But this is it. Tannehill's contract is up. They're not going to resign him. He'll probably go somewhere for vet minimum or, or more as a backup. I don't blame him. Tannehill's still good. Uh, Henry, here's my problem with that. Derrick Henry's my favorite player out there right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is uh, a neat guy to hear, talk to. He's uh, I, I cannot, I can't wear a nose ring like he can. He's just, he can do those <laughs> things. He turned 30. A couple of days ago, wow. a few days ago, he turned 30. So apparently that's when everything falls off the table. Do the Titans resign him or do we let him go? I was kind of concerned. And at the same time, I probably would expect it that them, that they trade him at the trade deadline. Amy Adams shrunk said, Nope, we don't trade mm-hmm. him. Like, ah. <laughs> do you resign him? Do you resign him for a two year, $10 million contract? Would he take that or would he go test the free agent market? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Titans are going to be struggling next year, but we do have the sixth or seventh pick. Do you pick an offensive lineman uh, or do you pick a wide receiver? The best wide receiver will be off the board at that time, Marvin Harris, Harrison Jr. Do you go second or third? And do you pick up a quarterback in the third or fourth round to mm-hmm. compliment Levis along with a veteran who mm-hmm. wants to come in? Levis is our quarterback of the future right now. I think he's proved that he is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the same time, do you have, uh, do you do like a Robert Griffin and Kurt cousin type thing with the Redskins a few years ago and pick a guy in the same draft that turns out to be better than the guy that you picked earlier? I don't know. Yeah. And it's interesting. Cause I, <clears throat> when you mentioned Malik and Liberty, I was like, the Steelers used to have a tight end, Eric Green, and I swear he went to Liberty. And I just looked it up, and sure as hell, he was from Liberty as well. He was a very good tight end for the Steelers back in the like yeah. 80s, 90s. And apparently they have good insurance with a catchy jingle too. <laughs> now, and now everybody's catching that right now that yeah. knows what I'm talking about. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and, you and everything like that. That's funny. Never oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome, guys. It's the earwig of the day. Yeah. So, Jeremy, you're, you mentioned Vanderbilt. Uh, and are you a college football fan for that reason? You still follow college football? Are you follow any other teams, perhaps the Tennessee Volunteers? Give our listeners I, a taste. I tried the volu- yeah. I tried the volunteers and, Didn't and I work. just can't do it. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work. And and I don't have any problem with it. Here here's here's the thing, Harv, that I, I want people to know. I will talk about Tennessee, you know, oh Tennessee, Tennessee, bad, bad, bad. I don't care. I think it's funny. And most people that know me understand that I don't mean anything by it. Mm-hmm. And they get they go after me and we got and we have a good time. And that's the thing about it. I, mm-hmm. I met people who take things way too seriously and i don't really deal with them much because you know you might say something where you like a certain team and they get mad why don't you like this i was like okay football is not life but football makes life better yeah if you want to be a fan that loves your team to the point that you're unhappy for a month because they lose that's fine you do you uh for me say yesterday i did a funeral didn't know the lady it was I try my best when I do those types of funerals hard. It's hard, but we're driving to the graveside and over in a corner, you know, you try to look around and pick up stuff. And I saw a a tombstone that had the UTT on the back and said, ball for life. Hmm. I respect that. Yeah. 
I respect that. I respect your fandom of, of the Steelers. I respect people's fandoms of anything. I mean, that's what this football family is about. I want to hear why people like their team. Sure. Even the Ravens. I had a, I've had a couple of people who are Baltimore Colts fan who take up the Ravens. I had a moment where I had to choke down the word Raven, but I did it because they like the Ravens. Uh, I, I grew up a Vanderbilt fan because they were a local team. But after I realized that the Commodores will never be better than six and six hmm. or, or seven and six, I just couldn't handle it because they're, they're in the SEC for the money. They're not in the SEC to win it. They're awful. Well, we moved down to – my wife and I moved down to Aliceville, Alabama, and that is a crimson world. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's crimson. And Tuscaloosa was an hour away, and we'd go there, and we got to drive by Bryant Denny's. It's beautiful. It's a it's a neat place. Both of – well, two of my kids were born in Tuscaloosa. Mm-hmm. So – I started following Alabama. I remember going to a tennis or Vanderbilt game in Nashville and Alabama came and Vanderbilt fans were one fourth of the stadium. It was crimson everywhere. And that tells you about Vanderbilt fans. Mm -hmm. We're just, you know, I say we Vanderbilt fans are very wishy washy at times when it, with their team, when they're losing and I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. Uh, It gets, it gets old after, after a while. I mean, if you find a true Vanderbilt fan, they are battle tested. They're like the New York Jets in the NFL. They're battle tested and they're they're legit. And I respect that. But again, when I go down there, I I started seeing, and I went to the Coach Bryant's uh, museum before I left to move up where I am now. And it's at that point that if I say that I'm a college football fan, walking into that museum and seeing all these things and smelling the smells and hearing the things, Mm -hmm. you cannot help but appreciate what Coach Bryant did. Sure. And uh, later on, Nick Saban would do. Mm -hmm. And so Monday I was at my parents' house watching the Michigan game. And am I a college football fan? No. I I talked to my friend, and, and you need to get him on your show if you can, Dana Augusta. Okay. He is a college football fan that knows more than – has forgotten more than I'll ever know. Really? And, you know, I, I was talking to him. I was like, yeah, I like the Tide. I'm I'm more of a pro guy. But if you were to say, well, what's your college team? It's it's the Tide. And watching them win the playoffs in the, in the world cha- – or the college championships recently has is, is been a big deal. And my friends down in Alabama are, are just – they have been spoiled rotten. Mm-hmm. Wow. And it's good. I mean, again, if you can win the championships, enjoy every bit of it. Well, next year will be interesting when they add 12 teams to the mix and not just the four. So that's, it'll be good because uh, we'll, we'll see a better competitive uh, championship. I think Uh, nobody's going to be excluded. And and I see Michigan. Yeah. I see Michigan winning uh, Monday. I see him winning. Now Washington, if you win, if Washington wins, it doesn't. It won't surprise me. But I see Michigan win the way they held up against a couple three waves of the the tide there, and that was not meant to be a pun, but it came out that way. Uh, they they proved that they were the better team Monday, and to me, I think they'll be the better team next Monday. Total Sports Recall is sponsored by Mira Artistry, where you can purchase beautiful fine art photography and abstract art. Contact Mira Artistry in regards to commissions and availability of the pieces on her site. She would like to create something special for you. For the photography and art lovers in your life, Mira Artistry has the perfect gifts for you. Visit Mira Artistry at www.miraartistry.com. That's M-E-R-A-A-R-T-I-S-T-R-Y.com. MiraArtistry.com. Well, what what bothers me, and maybe I'm a traditionalist, and you know, when that when they when they realign the conferences and the the divisions in in the NFL a few years ago, where Seattle went to the NFC, it always bothered me because they're AFC West team, and Dallas is not in the East in the NFL NFC, but to keep the tradition alive, they're NFC East, and I wanted that. So when the 
when you look at the NCAA, I always had the Pac-12 and the SEC, which would be 12 teams, and now it's not going to be. And then you have the ACC, which is dying. And then you have the Big uh, Big East. You remember the Big East? I think oh, yeah. they're still alive in the basketball, mm-hmm. but not football. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then you have the, the MAC, which is an underrated conference. I really like the MAC t- conference. And then uh, mm-hmm. at the time, they had what the, uh, the SWAC which mm-hmm. Arkansas was part of, if I if, again, if I got that down, and now they're in the SEC, and I get that yeah, Arkansas being the SEC, but Oklahoma, Texas, I Texas A and M, it's all and about, the Pac twelve is is dying. All about money, it is. So we'll go back to football now, Jeremy. So, in your opinion, Jeremy, who's the best all around player? In Titans or Houston Oilers history? Oh. <laughs> oh, you put me on the spot at 9.07 yeah, Central Time. Best <laughs> overall player. Uh, golly. Tough one. If you want to talk about the most athletic player I've ever seen, athletic, it's Chris Johnson. Insane mm-hmm. how good yeah. he was. But fast. the best overall player, oh, fast. He could cut. Later on, he developed catching. He was, and when they drafted him, I think twenty eighth out of Eastern Carolina. He, I was like, who in the world is Chris Johnson? That's why I'm not a GM. Um, <laughs> best overall player though could do it all. Probably Warren Moon. Mm-hmm. But Javon Curse is my probably my all time favorite Titan. He could do in a lot of things too. Yeah. Uh, I, I Blaine Bishop is one of my favorites. Uh, I, I like I said, I played years once the Titans came. I played years of mm-hmm. them with 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 uh, on Madden. Craig Hendrick was a good punter. Uh, Rob Bronis mm-hmm. was a great kicker. I really mm-hmm. Rob Bronis tragically passed, but he was one of the best kickers I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. I didn't um, know. I that. go back. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it was a car wreck. It was awful. Uh, wow, but. Go back to the 80s when I started really paying attention to the Oilers. Chris Sanders was good. Um, they had mm-hmm. a few people in the defense, but they weren't well known. Then you have Warren Moon, which is probably him and McNair to me. And then Ron Tannehill would be the top three quarterbacks in Oilers Titan history, although they had several, mm-hmm. uh, several before. Mm-hmm. And, and again, I go back to the 80s. So if you, if you're yelling at the radio or the, the, the podcast, I don't remember much historically. I've read that Dan Pasquini was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had some good, good players during the Bum Phillip age and then before that, Billy mm-hmm. Cannon. Um, yeah. But the ones that you're asking me what I can tell, the best mm-hmm. overall player I've ever it's either Javon Curse, Warren Moon, mm-hmm. Chris Johnson, um, put, put Eddie George or Steve McNair up there, and mm-hmm. right now the best player that the Titans have. I've had in a long time is, is Derrick Henry. Hey, you got to throw Earl Campbell in there. I watched him play. Oh, oh my gosh. I, I apologize about that. Earl Campbell. I can remember the, the, yeah. I think he was playing the, the saints where he got his Jersey ripped off. It, Earl Campbell. He's a, yes, he's a Campbell. I, I, I think so. He's a freight train. I mean, he just to run people over. I mean, just and literally. It was a short period of time. It was a short <laughs> mm-hmm. period of time that he played, that but dude, he made such impact. He had dude had the biggest thighs I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he was just a monster. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm I'm glad you brought him up because when he got yeah. drafted, they didn't know what to expect, and then he came in mm-hmm. and just took. He came in like Miley Cyrus, like a wrecking ball, and he oh, yeah. took over. The, uh, he took over the NFL for a few years. And the one time the Steelers got him was Donnie Shell, and he got turned the wrong way, and Shell blasted him right in the ribs, and I believe he broke his ribs. Um, so you can actually find that hit on uh, YouTube as well. So the last question I have for you to wrap this up, Jeremy, is do you enjoy any other sports, and if so, which? I grew up playing basketball and watching baseball. Uh, I played basketball for years. So my team growing up was the – Los Angeles Lakers, because that's the only team that we can really watch in the area because they were so good. And then the Bulls came around. Mm-hmm. But I grew up mostly a baseball fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, it started with the Red Sox, and then it was the A's. Of course, mm-hmm. again, we don't have a local team here. And then when 
the Braves sure. started to get better, I became a Braves fan because, yes, I was a bandwagon fan. But mm-hmm. if you were to ask me now who my team is, it's the Redskins, Redskins, Red Sox. And, uh, you know, I don't watch a lot of baseball, but I do pay attention to it. Sure. Uh, the, what the what the Rangers did this year was amazing. I still think uh, the Tampa Bay Rays will do well if if they can finally figure mm-hmm. out where they're going to land. If they come to Nashville, mm-hmm. hey, come on to Nashville. Uh, we'll we'll <laughs> take you. We'll be the Nashville Stars and we'll play some baseball. And I will go there. There you go. Uh, but I've been to several uh, Braves games in in three different uh, stadiums that they had. It was it's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Uh, and I and the Predators when they came to Nashville, I was I've been to several Predators games for the for the NHL. Wanted to go during their Stanley Cup run, but Nashville is awful when it comes to traffic. The city is built very small. Wow. When they think of Nashville, where where the Titans are located across the Cumberland, on the other side is Second Avenue, which was bombed a few years ago, and they were just talking about it recently. I forgot about that on huh. Christmas. It was bombed. It was yeah. awful. Hard. You need to look at mm-hmm. it. It's terrible. Okay. Um, yeah. You go up about five, four or five blocks. You have the arena where the Predators play, those roads are very, very small, very narrow, mm. and parking hmm. is awful. So what you have to do is you would park here in Hurricane Mills and walk an hour and a half there, and you'll get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've been to several Predators games, been to several. I, I appreciate hockey. I don't understand a lot of it because I'm an American who didn't have <laughs> hockey. I, well, it's, I'm an American yeah. who was not around hockey. If you're sure. north – where you were, uh, mm-hmm. you would get a lot more hockey because you have the, the Penguins. My father-in-law sure. is a huge Penguins fan. Oh, you boy. have the Flyers down the road. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the Devils, which are not terribly far from you. Nope. Um, and and that's that's you know I I understand I respect uh, you know my grandfather was a, a NASCAR fan, so I grew up watching that. Played the mm-hmm. EA Sports NASCAR games uh, instead wow. of studying in college. I played the mm-hmm. NASCAR games. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that I will pay attention to, but I don't, and I respect other people who watch it, but if you were to ask me who's playing now in those sports, I probably yeah. wouldn't know very many. Mm-hmm. Well, I grew up loving all sports. So, um, as a matter of fact, uh, I did watch NASCAR growing up and Richard Petty was my favorite driver. So I used to watch his races. Um, but you mentioned before about the respect for fandom. And, and when I first moved to Jacksonville and I'd turn on and listen to sports radio and you'd get these callers. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm relocating from Atlanta. I used to be a Falcons fan. Now I'm a Jaguars fan. Uh, and these people would turn their backs on the, <laughs> the teams they grew up with. And I would be scratching my head going, where are you coming from? I, said, I would never, ever, ever, ever in my lifetime cheer for any other team other than the Steelers because that's where I'm from. I, uh, okay, this is going to be hypocr- uh, hypocritical. Okay, hypocritical, 100%. Because I'm no longer a Vanderbilt fan. I've turned my back on the team because they basically turned their back on the fans. That's different than saying I'm moving from right. Pittsburgh to Jacksonville and become a Jacksonville fan. Right. You, I I think it's funny and and – I did a wedding a few years ago where a guy came dressed. They, the, both of them came dressed as they had their Pittsburgh jerseys on. That's why oh they want to be married. I said, All right. <laughs> and, and this is in Tennessee. Oh so gosh. growing up here, you had two teams or three teams, maybe mm-hmm. that, that people respected. It was the, the Steelers, the Cowboys, and in certain areas, it was the Colts. Okay. It was the Baltimore Colts. If you're a little bit older. Mm-hmm. We went at each other, but I knew them and they knew me and we were having fun. We were, we were grinning because the Titans cannot compete with your Super Bowls. Uh, they like the Steelers even during the hard times. Wow. I respect that. If you travel, if you're coming from Buffalo to Houston okay, for work and you have to relocate, first off, it's very, very hot there, so be ready. But number mm. two, bring your Bills fan with you. Mm-hmm. Put up your bill stuff around your house. That's right. Don't just leave them because you come. Now, can you respect the Texans? Yes. Can you like the Texans? Yes. But to say that they're now my favorite team, mm-hmm. maybe they will become your favorite team because you see the local. But don't just drop them because you move. It's just, if I ever leave this area here, 
I'm taking my Titans with me as excess baggage. It's just going to be the way it is. As you and should. As you should. But again, Harvey, and I appreciate you having me on here. The Football's Family podcast is about fandom. I've talked to several authors and love how much love they have for their topics. Jack Gilden had a great one um, about his Baltimore Colts. Uh, I love I love Rich Melter, who's become a real good friend of mine. Uh, we have related on so many issues. He talks about his Oakland, Los Angeles, Oakland, Las Vegas Raiders fandom. And while I grew up a Broncos fan, we've related on so many issues that we can laugh at each other and have a good time. And it doesn't mean anything. It's just, we can enjoy that. You and I, uh, over the past few months have gotten talking. And even though Mm -hmm. I'm not a Steelers fan Mm -hmm. and you're not a Titans fan so much, we can laugh at each other and have a good time and not mean anything. It's not going to be hurtful. Um, I had a guy come on. Yes, it is. I had a guy come on and talk about the Eagles and I, know the Eagles from history, Randall Cunningham, you know, Reggie White, all those guys. He sang the Eagle fly, Eagle fly song on my podcast. And I just <laughs> loved it. I loved it. Yeah, that's and great. he didn't take it serious. He knew he said, I'm not a good singer. I said, I don't care. Do it. It was awesome. It was I'll awesome. To that. Oh yeah, please. Uh, it, uh-huh. it was one of the cooler things that, that I got to hear on this, in those podcasts. It's just, it is what it is, Harp. That's where, we're, you know, when, when I first got on the S- Sports History Network, there's a lot of historical. You're historical, uh, a lot mm-hmm. of historical. And I mm-hmm. said, I want to do something a tad different, but still be historical. Mm-hmm. Sure. And having these guys on, having you on, and having, I think I've had 120 episodes, 121 episodes right wow. now. It's, I've been blessed. I have been blessed. Yeah. It's been fun. It mm-hmm. helped me during uh, COVID. It helped me during this, mm-hmm. my son's death. Mm-hmm. We had a, a flood here a couple of years ago that killed 22 people. It was yeah, awful. I and yeah, I, I did a podcast about that that helped me heal. And, and I think it did some good for the town because I think people donated to mm-hmm. Waverly for that. It's just been a lot of fun. Yeah, these podcasts are great, and everybody's doing them. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm having a guest coming on who wants me to help launch his own podcast. Uh, he's an athlete from Pittsburgh, and uh, <clears throat> that that announcement will be on Twitter. But he's he's going to be scheduling. But one thing I wanted to note about the fandom and changing cities and all this stuff, and you'll always hear it. Oh, Steeler fans travel well. Steeler fans travel well because we're at every stadium. Well, the fact is, some of those people are traveling, but a majority of those people are living in those cities. And that's the case. And I think last week would have been proof because they said about 20% of the stadium in Seattle was Steeler fans. Now, you can't tell me that 20% of those people traveled out west from Pittsburgh or anywhere else to go to that game. They're living there, a lot of them. Well, but like I said, that during the 70s, who did you have? You had the Steelers. You might have had the Colts on their downward slide. You had the Cowboys ascending. And then, uh, you know, the Oilers were decent. But you had maybe, maybe two teams, and even the Jets were still holding over mm-hmm. from the 69 Super Bowl. And then the Chiefs doing what they did. Minnesota. Minnesota, was, I left them out. They went to four Super Bowls. So sure. you're looking at – man, Minnesota was very local. Very local. But the, the state uh, nationwide teams were the Steelers or the Cowboys. And the Cowboys – uh, being called America's team really put a put emphasis on their team. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show, Jeremy. And at this time, uh, let our listeners know about your podcast again and where they can listen to it at and any other projects you're working on as well as anything else you'd like to add. Well, Harvey, the last year I've started to finally – and, and this is kind of a downer, but it's it's what it is. I started finally grieving over my son's death, so I haven't really done much. This year, I plan on writing articles for the Sports History Network. I plan to do a lot more podcasts. And I may not start my own website like you have, but uh, I've enjoyed doing this, and I want to keep going. So if you want to be part of the Football's Family Podcast, number one, it's available on any 
podcast and I'm, I'm actually solid on some things like it's on audible. It's like, how in the world am I on mm-hmm. audible? But it is, it is. Uh, but any podcaster of choice, um, if you want to be on it, two ways that you can get a hold of me, uh, number one, probably can get a hold of me through the sports history network. But if you really want to get a hold of me, just I'm at Jeremy J E R E M Y underscore M C F A R L I N on Twitter. And that will be the number one way to get a hold of me. And then I'll give you my email and we'll go back and forth and give you time. You talk about whatever you want to, that would be your show. I'll be there to to poke fun at it and you'll be there to poke fun at me again. It won't mean a thing. We'll have a good time. Uh, typically it's about a 40 minute podcast, so it's not really long. And if you want questions beforehand, I will send them to you, but mostly I love the free flow. I love, uh, just hearing people's reactions and, and seeing their reactions and the vast majority of things. In fact, pretty much all of the ones I've had have have very heartfelt discussions and I just love hearing people's fandom. Titans fandom is very small, but hearing yours or the Eagles fans or Buffalo's fans, it's a lot longer and I, and and I just like to hear it and it's neat. Fantastic. Well, that's going to wrap up this episode of total sports recall. And I want to thank Jerry McFarlane for coming to total sports recall if you'd like to comment on this show, you can send an email to totalsportsrecall at gmail.com or reach me on Twitter using my handle of TSR at TSR. Um, that is TSR hard 59. This podcast and others can also be listened to on YouTube at the Total Sports Recall channel, which can be found by searching on the show name above. There's also the Total Sports Recall website found at www.totalsportsrecall.com. Make sure you check my Twitter account tomorrow for an announcement of tomorrow's podcast, where my guest is going to be a Pittsburgh basketball legend. Uh, So for Jerry McFarlane, this is your host, Harv Aronson, wishing everyone a wonderful week ahead. Thank you. The contents of this podcast do not represent the opinions of others and are solely the opinions of Harv Aronson based on his experience, knowledge, and research. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Do you wish you knew more about the 100 seasons of the NFL? You're in luck because you found the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. From the founding of the league in an auto showroom, all the way to what it is today, America's favorite sport and a behemoth of an industry. My name is Ernie Chapman. Football is my passion, and I want you to come along with me each week to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board, my DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.